Um, for those of you that don't know, um, I'm going to be doing three presentations in a row. Um, so the first one's on the big three, which is um, kind of a term that we use to represent three biocompatibility tests that everybody have to do, has to do on medical devices. It's the cytotoxicity, the sensitization, and irritation test. So um, if you want to hang out with me for the next you know, couple of hours, that's great. We'll get to know each other you know, afterwards. We'll go get a drink or something. But um, so hopefully the, the, these three hours will be enjoyable for you and informational. Um, and then I can make it through it. So um, to kind of give you an idea, I kind of mentioned the big three already, the cytotox, the sensitization, the irritation. Um, these three tests have been around for a very long time. And if you've ever done biocompatibility testing on a medical device, you're probably familiar with these three tests. What I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm going to give you some ideas on the big three, uh, which tests to choose, because there's multiple tests in each category, and kind of how do we sample prep the test, how do we set the test up, um, and kind of what we look for for each of those tests. The first thing that we have to address with the big three is the direct or indirect methods. And that's because with these three tests, specifically these three tests, there's a direct method and an indirect method for each of these tests. So what the direct method means is that the device is in direct contact with the test system. So if it's an in vitro test, like the cytotoxicity test, the sample itself is in direct contact with the cells. If it's an animal test, like the sensitization irritation, the sample is in direct contact with the skin of the animal. So we have a direct contact with the device material and the test system. With an um, extraction or indirect, sometimes it's heard by uh, the term, um, we look at a test that we extract in some kind of media. We then take that extract and put it in contact with the test system. So the thought process here is that we put this device, whatever it may be, in a solution. And that solution consists of both polar and nonpolar media. And then those polarities are supposed to bring off chemicals off the device. And then we take that soup now, after an extraction, and we take that soup and use it for the test. So this is supposed to incorporate all the chemicals that can leach off a device and incorporate in the test system. So once again, for an in vitro test, we take that extract and put it on the cells. In the animal test, we inject it in, uh, under the skin of the animals, and then we see what kind of impact it can have. Um, to give you an idea for an extraction methods, for the cytotoxicity, we have the MEM elution is probably the most common. There are some other ones. The MTT, XTT is starting to gain some traction. For sensitization, we have magnesium cligmin and LLNA. And for the irritation, we have intracutaneous reactivity. And the, one of the first things you'll realize that in, in biocompatibility, we can never have a short word, right? Everything has to be really long and, and hard to say. For the direct contact, we have the auger overlay, or the direct contact test, for the cytotoxicity. We have the Bueller closed patch method for the sensitization, and the primary skin for the irritation. Now you might be asking yourselves, how do I choose which one do I run, the direct or indirect? The, kind of the, wor the, the rule of thumb that we use is that if your device is in intact skin contact, so if you're looking like a mask or a gown, or something that's just covering the skin of the, of the patient, then we want to use the direct contact test. If you have any fluid contact with the body whatsoever, we want to do the extraction version. If your device is in a gray area, so let's say it's in a um, burn or a mucosal membrane that gets a lot of fluid exchange, then we want to lean towards the extraction. The extraction's worst case. And in fact, I've been doing biocompatibility for 13 years. And the last two or three years, the FDA has been asking to justify most of the direct contact tests. They want to know, how is this representative to the clinical contact? So if you don't feel like you can justify that contact, go towards the extraction. Because we don't see very many questions on the extraction method. OK, first part of this big three kind of test, and this kind of incorporates all of biocompatibility. In fact, most people, when they ask me about so let's say that they go to a lab and they fail a test. And then they send it to another lab and they pass a test. Then they come to me and ask, well, what's different? Why did I pass in one and why did I fail in the other? The first place I always go is sample preparation. And that's because once we get an extract of a device, from that point on, everybody does exactly the same test. 
Everybody follows the same parameters. Uh, there might be some differences in how they're scored, uh, but mostly everyone does the exact same test once they get an extract. But the sample preparation can be so variable, depending on who prepped it, on what the sample looks like, and what's the end result, okay? So um, always pay attention to how the sample is prepped. And I'm gonna spend some time on the preparation because it's, in my opinion, one of the most important parts of any lab that you use to be able to give them clear instructions on how you want to prep the sample. In fact, I would recommend calling them up and discussing the sample, how it contacts the patient, and discussing how you want to prep it so that everyone's on the same page so that you're not, they're not prepping it wrong or that the FDA is not asking you how it was prepped and you don't know. So when we're looking at sample preparation, and we're only going to look at the extraction methods here, because with the direct methods, you just cut small pieces of the material and put it on the, on the test. So really, preparation is not a big deal there. But for an extraction, once again, we're putting the sample into a solution. So we want to be able to know what portions of the sample we're putting in and how much solution we're adding. So let's take my clicker, OK? Let's say this is a great medical device that I just came up with. Now, I could take this device and I could put it into a liter or five liters of media, right, and extract it. Or I can put it into 100 milliliters of media. Obviously, if I put it into 100 mils, it's more concentrated. So the chemicals that come off are going to be more concentrated than if I put it into five liters. So if I put in five liters, the tests are going to probably pass. If I put in 100 mils, who knows what's going to happen, right? So in that concept, the ISO 10993-12, which is the sample preparation standard, gives us two ratios that we can use. We can either use weight or surface area. So I can either weigh this device, and the heavier it is, the more fluid I can add to extract it, or I can calculate the patient contacting surface area of the device, and then the more surface area it has, the more volume I can add, okay? So those are your two options. Now I'm gonna give you an example of how you can be careful when you're looking at those extractions. This is a partial knee implant. Okay, pretty, pretty simple device actually. Some metal, and a, one type of metal, one type of plastic, some surface um, uh, to it, but really it's a simple device. Okay, so if we look at the, that device, it weighs 93.9 grams. And that's actually, that's pretty heavy for a metal device, but trust me, with hips and knees and things like that, you can get a lot heavier, okay? So in the standard for weight, we use a 0.2 grams per mil ratio. So if we use that ratio with this device, that would give us 468.5 mils of extraction fluid. So a half a liter is what we'd be extracting this device in if we chose weight. Now the surface area of this device is 115.8 centimeters squared. Okay? And that is actually incorporating all the little grooves and, and dots and things like that. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty uh, good surface area. If we use the appropriate ratio in the standard, we use three centimeters squared per mil. So that would give us 38.6 mils, or almost 40 mils. So when comparing these two totally valid preparation techniques, right, both are in the standard, both would uh, comply to ISO 10993, with the weight, we would add 12 times more media than the surface area. So if you did weight at one lab and surface area at another lab, then you'd probably have an opportunity, at least, to fail and pass, okay? So that might think, okay, well, everybody does it by weight, right? And three or four years ago, actually, that's what we did. And it's mostly because weight's easy. Anybody can take a device, put it in a scale, and tell you how much it weighs and add the media, right? So three or four years ago, we used to weigh almost everything. But then what the FDA started realizing was this ratio was flawed, right? Because weight was so much a, a best-case scenario that the FDA now asks you to do surface area for all the devices. In fact, I can almost guarantee you that if you use weight, you're going to be asked, why did you use weight? And the answer, well, it required less sample, never works. We tried that. It doesn't work. Um, the only times that we use surface area and can justify it is that, one, if it's a, if it's a powder, okay, we can still, I mean, it's hard to get a surface area of a powder. So we weigh that, and that's fine. Um, an absorbent device, like a sponge, because it's in, very difficult, we've done it, but it's very difficult to try to calculate all the internal channels of a sponge, where all that fluid is gonna be absorbed. So we have an absorbent ratio by weight that we can use per standard. And then we have been successful when uh, weight is worst case. So very light devices, 
Um, weight would be worst case and surface area, and we can get by with that. But really, my recommendation is choose surface area because the FDA is probably not going to ask you to justify it. And personally, I don't like responding to questions from the FDA, so I just do uh, surface area unless I have another, uh, no other option. Okay, so we know we want to use surface area, so that's why that one would probably be best for most products. The next question on there is, can I give the lab the surface area? And we, let's look back at that partial knee, right? So if we look back at the partial knee, if you look at all those little grooves and, and, and bumps, if you don't give me the surface area of the device, I'm gonna break this down into simple geometric shapes, right? So it's gonna be a square or a rectangle. Um, it's gonna be a very conservative surface area calculation. So it's gonna be a worst case test for you. But you guys, or at least the engineers, have these wonderful CAD drawings and computer programs that I love to look at, but I have no idea how to use it. All you have to do is push a button and it'll give you surface area, right? So you can get more accurate, which means you have more surface area, because I'm going to give you less surface area how I perform it. And that way, the test is going to be better for you and more accurate, right? Because the surface area is more representative. The other thing that you want to think of is the more surface area you have, the less samples you have to send me. Because all these tests require a certain amount of volume to test. So if you give me this, this sample to do the surface area, and I do my uh, very simplistic uh, geometry calculations, I'm going to require a lot more devices to get the same volume as if you provide me the surface area. Make sense? The other thing I want to kind of hit home here is we only want to test the patient contacting portions of the device. There's a lot of times that I get a delivery device for a stent, for example, and the, the, the sponsor is concerned about the handle of the device. Well, the clinician is hand, ha, holding onto the handle. So most of that delivery device might be external to the body. But if we include all that surface area, we're diluting out the distal end of the device, which is the patient contacting. So the distal tip of the device is actually what's contacting the patient. And if we add all the other material, we can be diluting out the potency of that test. So we want to be careful. We only want to include the portions of the device that have patient contact. The other thought you want to have is, I don't need functional devices. So if you have electronics in there, I don't want electronics. Okay? I only want to have what contacts the patient, and it can be in different types of, of forms. We just have to have the same material in the same proportions with the same processing. So I don't need a finished uh, finish. I need a representative finished device, but I don't need a functional device that you sell on the market to test. So there's ways we can cut down sample size and samples that way. OK. Um, I'm going to talk about one last question here, which is, if I change the surface area, can it impact my results? And if we think about proportions, it can have a huge impact on results. I'll take my great device here, right? You guys can't see it, but this little laser pointer has a red ink. First off, I hate inks, OK? If you can make your device without ink, please do so. I know marketing is going to want a purple. But you guys don't have to try to, well, you will, but you don't have to deal with the FDA on colorants. Okay? They, really, they don't like colorants, which means I don't like colorants. But if marketing makes you increase that red because doctors love it, right? I've heard that a hundred times. Doctors love this color, so we want to make more of it. So I'm changing the color from this to the whole surface of it is now going to be red. While I haven't changed materials, right? I haven't changed processing, I've just made one material larger. But if you think about how we do the test, we do it by surface area. So before, the surface area of this red ink was very small. If I increase it, now the weight of that surface area of that ink becomes more compared to the rest of the device. So if that ink is toxic, it probably wouldn't show up being small. But if I increase it, now it could. So even increasing surface area of a material in the device could have an impact in biocompatibility. So you have to assess it. OK, so once we know how much sample to put into a solution to extract. Now we got to know what, what temperature and time we extract it. And all these temperature and times are in the ISO 10993-12. The first one is just for cytotox. And we'll talk about that, why that is in a minute. But the rest of the four are in um, for all the other animal tests. Okay, So let's talk about the bottom four first. The 37 for 72 hours, the 50 degrees for 72 hours, the 70 degrees for 24 hours, and the 121 for 24 hours. Which one do you choose? The advice I can give is please do not choose 37 degrees for uh, 72 hours, OK? The reason why is the FDA is going to ask you to justify that 37 degree 
uh, temperature. And for us, we might think, well, 37 degrees is body temperature, so it mimics clinical contact. But in the FDA's mind, it's 72 hours is pretty short. And so if that device is in contact with the body for more than 72 hours, how do we represent what's coming off the device permanently? So by increasing the temperature to 50 degrees, we get a worst case extraction. Even if your device has less than 72 hour contact with the body, consider 50 degrees C. Because you're gonna get the question, and remember my philosophy, I'd rather not talk to the FDA unless I have to, right? So do it at 50 degrees C, so you don't have to try to justify why you chose 37. The only way that I do 37 degrees is if your glass transition uh, phase is 60 degrees or less. If it's in with 10 degrees of that 50 degrees, you start to de possibly denature the material, and so you could actually have uh, different chemistry come off than you intend. And we can justify that to the FDA. So if your glass transition phase is 60 degrees or below, use 37. But most materials are safe or fine at 50 degrees, so it's hard to use that justification very often. Okay, so now we know how much fluid to add to the device. We know how much of it or how long and what temperature it extracted in. The next is we actually go to the test system, okay? So the first test I'm gonna talk about is cytotoxicity. And I have started as a study director at Cytotox. I love this test, but I've seen that most people don't. <laughs> and the reason why is historically this is the most sensitive test. So it's gonna be your best friend and your worst nightmare which I'm gonna to try to explain a little bit here. So because cytotox is the most sensitive, you are most likely to fail. In fact, at Nelson Labs, over the last 20 years, we looked up all our biocompatibility failures, and 93% of them were cytotoxicity. Doesn't mean you're gonna fail cytotox 93% of the time, but it means if you're gonna fail a test, that's your most likely candidate, right? So that's why it's your, your worst nightmare, but it's your best friend because it's extremely cheap and quick. So, well, relatively, for me, it's, it's 165 bucks. For me, I don't want to spend that, but for biocompatibility, that's pretty cheap, and it takes about seven days, okay? So you can use it to your advantage to screen materials, uh, screen your device before you start expensive animal tests. Um, when you're changing something in your components, you can use it to help screen for potential impact. It's a great test to help see what's happening in your process. We've had people that want to know where in their uh, process line there might be something that's cytotoxic. So they'll go through each process, run a cytotox, and say, okay, if we don't clean off all of this material, it's going to fail cytotoxicity. So they'll make sure that that process is important. So there are some, there's a lot of great aspects to cytotoxicity. To kind of get you an idea of what cytotox is, this is my tools of the trade, so to speak. So the flasks up here, Eh, it's not working. So the flasks up there, that's what I call my cell farm. That's what we grow our cells in. So we use adhering cell lines, which means they attach to the bottom of the plate. And so they're growing up in these flasks. We break those cells apart, and then we seed them on the plates. And now we have something we can test in those six well plates. So the bottom of those plates have the cells. Then we take your extract of your device, and we put it onto those cells. And then we see what happens. We just let the chemicals interact with the cells and see what toxicity may occur. I wanted, this is an important point that I wanted to kind of share. So these are all the viable extraction fluids we can use per ISO 10993. And I mentioned before that we have to do a polar and a nonpolar. The reason why is because in our body, right, we have saline, we have sweat, all this stuff that's water-based. And then we have fats or lipids, um, serum, that are, are non-polar based. And just like vegetable oil and vinegar, they don't mix in a salad dressing, there are some compounds that will come off in polar and some that will come off in non-polar. So we have to do both the polar and non-polar extraction. The one exception in the big three is that last one, which culture mediums on both. And the reason why is because all these other non-polar options are cytotoxic by themselves. So if I extract in vegetable oil, if I extract in DMSO or PEG, those things are gonna fail, kill the cells just because the fluid kills the cells. We add 5% calf serum to our MEM fluid. So it has some non-polarity, but it's 95% polar, only 5% non-polar. Which means that if you have a compound that's lipophilic or likes to come off in oils, it might not come off enough in the cytotox. So that's one reason why cytotox doesn't fail all the time but most things are, are pretty soluble in water, so we get most of the results off in cytotox. 
But all the other animal tests, we use vegetable oil or all the other big three, the other two uh, tests in the big three, we use vegetable oil and saline. So we get a, a pure polar and non-polar. Okay, so this is the dashboard. I have them for each test. It gives you kind of an idea of sample requirements, turnaround time, and then usual problems, okay? We use latex as our positive control for cytotox. It burns the cells, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So if you have any latex in your device whatsoever, it's gonna fail. That's okay, because latex gloves have been on the market forever. This means we'll have to do some, some justification and some investigation to show that it's just latex that's causing cytotoxicity and justify it, okay? But to give you an idea, other things that are very commonly uh, that fail cytotox are silver, copper, zinc, any of those metals in that, that the periodic table, those will be cytotoxic. It just happens to be a lot of inks have, or uh, colorants have copper, zinc, right? Make them blue or black. So if you have um, anything that leaches off a device like adhesives or inks, it has a high probability of failing the cytotox test. In fact, at Nelson Labs, we joke around, we call it the smell test. If you open up the bag, like if anybody ever opened up the packaging of a device and you smell that volatile kind of chemical smell, yeah, that, that's probably not going to do very well in the cytotox test. And that's because all those chemicals that you smell are going to release into the extraction fluid at temperature. And a lot of those chemicals are cytotoxic. So make sure all your components are cured before you send them in to do the test. Okay, so once we put that extract fluid onto the cells, we have a scoring criteria how to evaluate cytotoxicity. 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this is right out of the ISO 10993-5 and the USP section 87. That's the two areas where we have uh, cytotoxicity references. This is the scale out of those two references, 0 to 4, and it's based off percentages. So a 0 is no cytotoxicity whatsoever, a 1 is less than 20% of the cells are affected, a 2 is between 20 and 50% of the cells are affected, a 3 is between 50 and 70%, and anything over 70% is a 4. This is also the only biocompatibility test that have acceptance criteria built into the standard. I want to tell you that's probably going to go away in the next revision of Dash 5. I'm on the committee and, and there's a lot of argument that we shouldn't be putting acceptance criteria. It should be based off of education or like educated people making assessments. I love having it built in so that I don't have to do that. But I can guarantee you 0, 1, and 2 is going to stay as passing. 3 and 4 is probably going to stay as failing, even if we take it out of the ISO. Okay? So that means that you can have up to 50% of your cells affected in some way and still pass the cytotox test. It just goes to show you how sensitive this test really is and how we're trying to levy against that sensitivity. So this is a zero, okay? This is um, our negative control, which is polypropylene pellets. And what we want to see is this great mosaic pattern in the cells. We want to see them stretching out, trying to make these, these uh, connections um, you see how there's red in the cells? That's a neutral red stain, which is a viable stain, which means healthy cells will bring it into the lysosomes. So we want to see that red, okay? This is a great example of a, of a no cytotoxicity compared to our positive control, which is latex. And here, you can kind of see some spaces in between if you kind of look, right? There's some things down there that look like they might be cells, okay? But latex is a fixative, so it burns the fibrogen of the cell to the bottom of the plate. So these are really the skeletons of the cell fixed to the bottom of the plate. If you think about it in a horror movie, it's pretty gross, gruesome, right? There on the bottom is one that might be still healthy or might be still alive, but definitely not healthy, okay? And you can tell by how granulated, how dirty it looks. In fact, this, these cells were stained with that neutral red too. You don't see any red except for that bottom, but it's covering the whole cell and not just the lysosomes. So these are some of the things that we look for to do cytotoxicity. Is there any questions about cytotox or sample prep before we go on? Anything I can help with? Okay. Yes. In themselves. Oh, sorry. The nonpolar or um toxic in themselves, and I missed how you get around that. So we use the, the, the serum that we, the MEM fluid we extract in has 5% calf serum. So calf serum is nonpolar, so we kind of justify saying we have some nonpolarity in there, and so we have some aspects of nonpolarity in our media, but it's, it's only 5%. 
So we don't really get around it very well, <laughs> but everyone just knows that you can't do a nonpolar in the cytotox. Okay. Um, to give you an idea, if we do extract in DMSO, we have to extract it, we have to dilute it down to 5% to even get it to where it's non-toxic. So you're diluting out your extract to 5%. So it's, it's just not really feasible. Good question, yes. I was just wondering if it was fair to do a pH adjustment of your media, or if that's kind of cheating. Great question, that's, that's a very good question. So to give you some background, cells are very sensitive to pH. In fact, we have a, uh, uh, a phenol red indicator in our media, which will turn purple if it's basic, will turn yellow if it's acidic. And the reason we do is because we can't have, a, it has to be around 7.3 pH in order for the cells to grow and be happy. If we do see a change in acidity, we will add either hydrochloric acid or we will sodium bicarbonate to move it to either direction. But we cannot add, personally in Nelson Labs, we do want la add more than one mil. If we can't move it after one mil, then we just justify this, the, the acidity and we go back to you, we always go to you when we see it, but then we tell you we can't change it and we try to justify. And the reason we don't want to add more than one mil is because we don't want to dilute out the extraction. If we do anything to the pH, we have to record it and the FDA is going to ask us why. And that's another reason we want to keep it within one mil. Um, so if you have an acidic sample, it's better to try to justify the acidity by removing it or justifying the cytotox altogether, in my opinion. It's a great question though. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. So the next one of the big three is sensitization. And to give you an idea what sensitization looks for, the best way to explain it is poison ivy. If you guys ever touched poison ivy, it's not great, right? Most of the time it's kids that go running around and get poison ivy. So um, poison ivy is a sensitization reaction. And what sensitization or type four hypersensitivity is, it's a repeated dose phenomenon. So we have to have multiple touches to that toxin before we break out, okay? So the first time you touch it, your body builds up some cells that remembers that, that toxin. And then next time you touch is when we have that redness and swelling that everybody knows about poison ivy. Uh, my favorite example, I'm a nerd, so I like to watch Mythbusters. Have you guys ever seen that show? And in Mythbusters, they were trying to do some common um, poison ivy uh, you know, cures or fixes. So they were trying to, to break out in poison ivy. So they all rubbed it on their skin, waited the next day, and the three of them didn't break out. So they said, huh, well, 10% of the population isn't you know, sensitive to, to, to poison ivy, so we just happen to be the three of us. So they brought in some volunteers, and they grabbed it and started rubbing on the volunteers, and guess what happened the next day when the three came back? They broke out, right? Because the first time, I'm guessing because they're actors and they don't actually get out in the wild very often, that was the first time that they contacted poison ivy. So the next time they touched it, the body broke out, and they didn't realize that you had to have it multiple exposures. So that's what we look for in this test. We look for multiple exposures to have a reaction. What that means to you guys is that this is the longest and the most expensive of the big three. To give you kind of a comparison, the Cytotox cost about $165 and took about seven days, right? This one cost about eight to $9,000 and takes eight to nine weeks, okay? So you don't want to fail this test. Luckily, this test fails very, very few uh, times, very rarely. And that's because there's not many things on your device that are sensitizers on purpose, right? You don't want to have those things around you or your workers or your device. But we still have to run it to, to screen for it. <clears throat> How we do that is the first one is the one that most people run, which is the maximization or the magnesium caligmin or the guinea pig max. They all mean the same things, okay? What we do is we use guinea pigs, and guinea pigs are very sensitive to sensitizers. That's why one reason we use them, okay? And we have to go through three phases. The first phase is we extract a sample in a polar and nonpolar, and we inject it in the guinea pig. Then we let the guinea pig rest. About a week later, we extract a brand new set of samples in polar and nonpolar, injecting the guinea pig. We let it rest, and then a little bit later, we take the polar and nonpolar extraction of brand new samples and we wet a patch. And we put the patch over the, the injection port point. And that's what we're looking for, that redness and swelling. Now the other downfall for the sensitization is the cytotox only had one extract, right? We only use that MEM fluid that we kind of said is polar and nonpolar, so we only need one set of samples to get that and surface area requirement. 
Here we have polar and nonpolar. We use saline and cottonseed oil or vegetable oil. And we have three phases. Each phase needs a separate set of samples. So you need six times more surface area for this test than you do cytotox. This test is, is very difficult to run for some people, especially small devices. It requires 720 centimeters squared of surface area. So it can be quite large for some devices. So we put that uh, multiple extraction or multiple injections and then that patch, and then we look for redness and swelling. Okay? Typical sensitization reaction. We actually grade it at different scales. This is just an example where zero means no redness and swelling, a one might mean slight redness or slight, slight uh, swelling, a two is slight redness and slight swelling, and then a three severe swelling and redness. This is just an example. Sometimes they go zero to four, just depends on your lab. But the point is, is that you want to score the redness and, and swelling and compare it to a negative control, which would just be the solution itself either saline or cottonseed oil injected into uh, test animal, control animals, okay? So grades of one or greater, when you look at the average of the test and control samples, grades of one or greater are considered sensitizers. So we wanna look at your control animals and all the, the comparison of the scores to your controls, and if you have a grade of one or greater than the control, you're considered a sensitizer. The next test that we're going to talk about for sensitization is called the local lymph node assay, or LLNA, if you don't want to say the whole thing, which I don't. So I'm going to call it LLNA. The LLNA is an interesting test. It was thought of as a replacement to the guinea pig max. And the reason why is the guinea pig maximization takes a lot of animals. It takes over 40 animals to run the test. So it's, it's very burdensome to the animals and, and to the lab. This test first off it's mice and for some reason people had more pet guinea pigs than pet mice I guess growing up so people don't care as much about mice but secondly it requires a lot less of them okay so what we do here is and for me I think it's a better endpoint so we take these three mice or these these sets of mice excuse me and once again we do multiple exposures so we take the extract but in, instead of injecting it into the mice we rub it on the back of their necks where the lymph nodes are and then if there's sensitizers in the extract, those sensitizers will penetrate the skin and interact with the lymph nodes. Now these lymph nodes are sensitive to sensitizers, just like the guinea pigs are, but what this happens is the lymph nodes will mutate. And I wish that mutation made the mice really strong and buff, but it doesn't. What it does is it allows the lymph nodes to soak up radioactive material, okay? Which maybe makes them strong and buff, but it doesn't. So what that does is we can rub the extracts in the back of the neck of the mice multiple times, and then we inject a small amount of radioactive material around the lymph nodes. Then we take those lymph nodes and measure how much radioactive material is in the lymph nodes itself. The more uptake of radioactivity, the more sensitization has happened. Okay? So there was a couple reasons why we love this test. One is because of the animals. Two is because we don't have a technician scoring how much redness and swelling. We actually get a quantitative amount of radioactive, right, radioactivity in the lymph nodes. Okay, So we take the average radioactivity of the test, divide it by the control okay, to give us the stimulation index. And if it's three or greater, you fail. So basically, you're allowed to have up to three times more radioactive, radioactivity in the, in the test uh, lymph nodes than the controls. So, the other thing that makes this, oh, I'll give you a, a real life example. So for a test, we got, uh, the test sample got 2,000, the negative control got 1,500. If you do the math, it's 1.32, so this sample is not a sensitizer. The other thing about LLNA that makes it awesome is that it only takes about three to four weeks to run. So the maximization takes eight weeks, eight to nine weeks, LLNA only takes three to four weeks. So you might be asking yourselves, why if it's, if it's less animals, if it's easier, if it's cheaper and quicker, why aren't everybody running LLNA? The FDA is not, well, the FDA will not accept LLNA if you have mixtures of device. So if you have multiple materials in your device, which most devices have more than one material. It will also not accept LLNA if you have metals in your device. The theory behind that is that this will look for, it won't look for synergetic effect from a systemic breakdown of, of chemicals. So for mixtures, 
it'll only look for one compound reaction. So for mixtures, you won't get the same biological reaction in, that you will see in a guinea pig. So the FDA doesn't want to see that. The other thing it won't see is metals are actually too large to penetrate, well this is the FDA stance, are too large to penetrate the skin because it's rubbing on the back of the skin. So they think that you won't get a positive result. And there's been some tests that show you can and some tests show you can't. So the FDA just says if you have metals, don't. And there are some metals that are sensitizers. In fact, that's the most likely uh, source of a sensitizer for a medical device, which is nickel, gold, right? Silver sometimes. So some of you that might um, have like cheap earrings and they get break out, a sensitization effect, nickel. Uh, I know someone who has such a bad nickel sensitizing effect that their jeans, the little nickel uh, button, will break and break out on their stomach. So some people have sensitization to metals. And so the FDA says, well, metals won't go through, so we can't accept metal. So that means if you have a polymer that's one source polymer, we can run a LLNA. Just happens to be the vast majority of the devices don't fall into that category. Okay? Any questions about sensitization? I'm going to cover, and for the sake of time, I'm going to cover Bueller just really quickly. But that's okay because the Bueller is very similar to the maximization. But instead of injecting it in, remember the Bueller is the, the uh, direct contact version instead of the extraction version. So for the Bueller, we're taking a piece of material and putting it on the back of the guinea pig. But we just take it, nine to induction. So three times a week for three weeks, we put a new patch on there. This is the point that I always want to tell you that just because you have a device that's skin contact, still the Bueller might not be the test for you. And that's because, remember, we're putting this on the back of a guinea pig. And if you give me this really big scanner that's like this big, and a guinea pig's this big, right, I can't put it on the back of a guinea pig and say, run around, right? So you have to kind of have a flat surface, and it has to be pretty light. So that's why masks and gowns and things like that work really well. Everything else, we almost have to do a maximization. But with the Bueller method, we just put it on the skin, remove it multiple times, and we look for the same redness and swelling that we do as, as anything else. Okay? Um, same scoring criteria as the maximization two, one or greater. Any questions about sensitization? The second test in the big three. Okay. The last test of the big three is the irritation. And we actually do see the irritation test fail, I don't want to say often, it doesn't fail often by any stretch of the imagination, but it does fail routinely, okay? And um, what the irritation looks for, and this is, the, this is the best example I have. So instead of a repeated exposure like the sensitization, it's a one dose, one time exposure and you get a, an irritation response. The example I have, it's a personal example, and sometimes I get embarrassed sharing it, but my wife went away with a, uh, so, some girlfriends for uh, overnight somewhere, and I was left with my kids. And so I thought I'd be a good husband and do the laundry, right? Get bonus points and things like that. Well, I realized we're out of laundry detergent. So I went to the store to get some laundry detergent, and um, I'm a guy, so I didn't buy the laundry detergent my wife always buys. I bought the cheapest, and I'm, uh, I'm ashamed to say that, but that's what happened. So I bought the cheapest laundry detergent, came back, and I did a load of laundry. Just happened to be pajamas, right? So I put my kids in the PJs for night, put them to bed. The next morning, guess what? They broke, they broke out, right? They had red dots all over their body. They had an irritation reaction to that detergent, and they never had to be exposed to that detergent again, okay? And then it <laughs> just happened to be that my wife had an irritation reaction to me after that. So, um, but you have to, Detergents are the most likely source of an irritation reaction. We see it, it most of the time with an irritation. If we have you rinse again or sonicate or things like that, we'll, we'll retest and we won't see that reaction. Or we'll run some chemistry to try to determine what it is and we'll come up with a detergent or some kind of chemical. Some kind of solvent or detergent is usually the source of an irritation reaction. Okay? There are things in our processes that are irritants. So most of the time, it's because we're not cleaning our devices or we're cleaning them, but we're not rinsing them properly is why we see an irritation response. How we run them, though, is very similar to the maximization. The difference is we run them in rabbits, okay? And we do just one exposure. We don't need to do six because it's one-time exposure gets an irritation. So we run in a polar and non-polar, and that's why it requires two times the amount of surface area than the cytotox. And it only takes about four weeks to run because of that. 
The other thing that you want to be careful for is the, is the irritation reaction specific to the part of the body that the device is in contact with. Okay? So eye irritation is going to be different from mucosal irritation. It's going to be different from skin irritation. It's different from intracutaneous. So we want to try to do the test that most mimics the contact of that device to the body. So if you're in the eye, we want to do an ocular, right? If you're in the mucosal, we want to do mucosal. Most devices do the intracutaneous, which is what's the test I'm going to explain here in a minute, because most devices just go in tissue or blood, and the intracutaneous is kind of the catch-all for that kind of irritation. Um, the other thing I want you to be pre-warned about is this is the only biocompatibility test in the last probably 20 years that's changed, and it changed in 2010. It went from a two-rabbit irritation to a three-rabbit irritation, and then they changed how it was scored. What that means for you is routinely what we do is we take the, the uh, we do a gap analysis, right? We take your report, we look at the scores, we apply the new scoring method to it, and we say that additional rabbit probably wouldn't have changed the results, therefore the two rabbit test still applies. So if you did your test before 2010, you could do that yourself or you could ask one of the labs to do it for you, but it's important to kind of try to grandfather those tests into the current standard, which is a three rabbit and a new scoring criteria. And when I say a new scoring criteria, it's just a more, it's a better defined scoring criteria. Before 2010, labs interpreted that criteria differently, so some labs scored differently than others, and now it's, ver it's much more precise on how to score. So this is what we look for, same basic concept, redness and swelling, okay, and most people see. Once again, three rabbits. <clears throat> we do five sites on one side and five control sites on the other. So we extract your device and we inject intercutaneous into the rabbit, five on one side, five on the other. The reason why we can get away with three rabbits is because an irritation is a localized reaction. So wherever it's at, it will irritate. Where sensitization is a systemic reaction, right? So I can touch it, my poison ivy in my hand, get the cells in my body, I can touch it in my foot and it'll break out. So we have to use one guinea pig for, um, per, per uh, exposure for the sensitization. But for localized, we can do multiple exposures. So we can get away with less animals. So we inject in the, the animals. We observe at 24, 48, and 72 hours. And we're just looking for the redness and swelling, the same scoring criteria. Then we take the, after that 72 hours, we take the total and divide it by 15. So we have three time points, right? Five injection sites, that's how we get the 15. Then we take those scores, add them together, and divide by three. So we get an average of all three rabbits. It's kind of how we do it. So you get an average irritation score for the test and an average irritation score for the controls. And then you compare them. If your test samples or your test rabbits have a score of one or greater than your controls, then you're an irritant or possible irritant. And that gives me probably to my last and most important point in all of this, just because you get a one in irritation or sensitization or a three or four in cytotoxicity doesn't mean your device is gonna kill somebody, right? Think about what we're trying to examine with these tests and think about what you need to do to look at the impact of failing. I've had tons of companies that fail a cytotox test and they say, that's it, this device is ruined, we're gonna have to like, shut down and read, go. You spent how many millions of dollars in, in time developing that device? A $165 test isn't gonna ruin it, right? We can, it's, it's something that you have to evaluate, but we can almost always come up with what's failing and a justification or a fix to that failure, okay? You guys usually aren't using bad materials. Most of the materials have been tested a million times. So most of the time, it's a process residual that's impacting the test, which we can fix. And if it happens to be a material, chances are it's a material that people have had problems with before, like latex, like silver, like copper, like zinc, and there's ways that we can justify that. So don't freak out if you have a failure, right? We can help you through it. Speak right to that. These are the steps I use to confirm a failure. And we have like just a couple more minutes, so I'm gonna go really fast over these, but to give you an idea of what we do to, to investigate a failure. The first one is we confirm the procedure. Okay, we wanna make sure the right test was done. <laughs> we wanna make sure the right test article is prepared. The sample prep was correct, right? We just wanna make sure that the test was done correctly. The next step is we wanna repeat. Does the repeat tests have the same? And this is easy in cytotox when it's cheap, sensitization not so much. The other thing that I like to do is break down the material into components, find out where the toxicity is coming from. 
One piece of advice there though, don't send in like this device once again, don't send in all these components separately and have me test because I'm gonna do the surface area of that component by itself. So now that component becomes 100% the surface area, right? And so it's gonna be worst case. Instead, send in all the components, but tell me you're investigating a failure and how much volume we added to the whole device. Then I can add each component to that volume of the whole device. Now the ratios are the same. And now I can really see where that failure is coming from for the whole device, not just the material by material. Does that make sense? Okay, so the next thing is eliminate the toxicity. We talked about additional rinses, sonication, replacing materials, things like that. Or you can accept. And not a lot of me many people do that, right? But we can do it. It's actually quite successful. The last thing you can do is label for safety. This is probably more common among cosmetics and, and other things. But have you ever seen those that say, may uh, have redness and swelling. If redness and swelling persists more than 48 hours, discontinue use. And they might not have done so well in irritation or decide they didn't want to do irritation tests. So there are some aspects of labeling for safety. Contains latex, for example, something you can put on there if you have latex. Okay, so I have the references up there for the USP and the, and the um, ISOs. Any last questions?